So thank you guys for jumping on. And if you forgot and my 10 minute reminder got you here, um, sorry that it was so short notice, but way to be flexible. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really, it's always so fun to see you guys. So grateful for you and just for the conversation we're gonna have. And so uh, James Grout is with us again. Um, he was with us back in December, yeah. And today, um, well, James, I don't think everyone knows you. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself Maybe I'll, okay. I'll introduce the topic and you, then you can just go into it and tell us That's about great. yourself. <laughs> sure. yep. Yeah. So James is going to talk to us today on reaching fringe students. So James was here with us in December. He led us in an awesome conversation. Today, we're going to talk about fringe students. And um, actually, James emailed me some of the like categories we're going to look over. Uh, and I think I, it's exciting to think about um, a conversation on some strategy on how to reach these students that are just harder to reach. So thanks for being willing to lead us in this and um, we look forward to hearing from you. And so let me pray and, and then we'll dive right in. Father, um, thank you for meeting us in the chaos and uh, thank you for being here with us. Um, thanks for the opportunity to gather as youth workers together and to talk about um, how to reach the lost. So would you guide our conversation and be with James as he um, leads it, Lord. We pray these things in your name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks everybody for uh, inviting me uh, back. Um, really, really love doing this. This is uh, one of the things I love the most is spending time with youth leaders and I don't get to do it as much as I used to. So. Uh, because my new job is uh, working a lot more with typically lead pastors, mission pastors, uh, mission committees, those kinds of things. So anytime I get to hang out with youth leaders, I'm, I'm happy about that. And uh, part of the reason for that is I, I think I've met all of you, at least virtually, but I'll just give you uh, just a real quick um, review of of my just my youth ministry connections. So I was, um, I was called to youth ministry when I was 18 years old, really really clear, specific calling from God. It was teach the Bible to teenagers is what I heard him say to me. And uh, that turned into a, a pathway that took me to Bible college. I went to Crown College in Minnesota back when it was still St. Paul Bible College and um, got a youth. I didn't get a youth ministry degree. I got a Bible and theology degree. Um, pardon me for one second. Hi, oh, we're going to work. Okay, love you. Um, sorry my my one of my favorite teenagers just poked her head in the door so um so i so i uh i became a youth pastor with that degree i wanted to teach the bible to teenagers and people told me that was the best way to do it so i became a youth pastor at a church in wheaton illinois called uh, blanchard alliance church at that time it's now called wellspring alliance church it's actually kind of a it's kind of a darling church of the alliance right now it was it was uh, on a significantly downward tra trajectory about the time that I was leaving there. Uh, it's not necessarily why I left, but it was not, it wasn't, things were not going well. It was an older an aging church and it was just not going well. And they merged with a Korean Alliance church uh, that was sort of a multi, already a multi-ethnic church. And now it's become this really cool hybrid of a uh, older generation sort of, uh, suburban white church and this really young vibrant uh multi-ethnic church and, and it's it's actually a really cool community there so mitch kim is the pastor out there i don't i think mitch he may have been out here to speak at an event not too long ago he spoke at council uh not this last one i think but the one before so anyway i was a youth pastor there for 20 years uh loved it loved all of my experiences there i made tons of mistakes and we're going to talk about some of those today. I'm not going to share specific stories about my mistakes, but I learned things from making mistakes. So I'll start just by encouraging you all that your mistakes are not, um, they're not only failures, they're also opportunities. So sometimes we fail, sometimes we drop the ball, sometimes we say something that we didn't mean to say or something we shouldn't have said or do something that whatever, but 
um, those mistakes that we make are opportunities for us to learn and to grow and hopefully someday do it differently uh, the next time. So that's some of what we're going to talk about today. And um, so ministry to fringe kids is sort of our subject. I want to make sure I'm not saying, I'm not saying French kids. Like if you have a French foreign exchange student, you should minister to them for sure, um, to him or her. But uh, we're actually saying fringe. And there, is, there used to be a way of describing students who are in your ministry and students who are outside your ministry. It was called folded and unfolded. Sp speaking of like a, sh a shepherd, kind of a shepherd analogy of sheep are in the fold and sheep are outside the fold. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into that too much, but this would sort of be the kids who they're a little bit on the, on, they're on top of the fence of the fold. Like they're the ones who aren't in, they're not necessarily completely out, but they're, you're just trying to figure out where do they fit. And so I'm going to put them in categories. If you're taking notes, I'm just going to give you, we're just going to go through one category at a time. And I'm going to share with you sort of my description or definition of what that particular category means. Um, and then I'm going to share a couple of ideas about how uh, how I think we can do better ministry to a student who fits in that category. But before I do that on each one, I'm going to actually stop and invite you to get a student in your mind, get the, get the face and the name of a student in your mind that fits the category that I've just described so that we're not just talking theoretically about students, but we're actually talking, talking about you have somebody in your mind and you're thinking, yeah, how do I interact with that student or how do they interact with me or not interact with me? Uh, what do I know about their family? What do I not know? All of that. So I want you to be thinking the, the, most, the most practical way for us to respond uh, today is to figure out how would we actually treat uh, students or, or minister to students differently um, in light of this conversation. So category number one, and I don't have fancy names for these, so I'm just going to, they're more descriptions. So the cat, first category is um, students who who attend your church but do not participate in youth ministry so their families are at your church you see them maybe on sundays i'm just going to forget that COVID exists and that we've not been meeting in church and all that stuff so let's just let's use our memories and go back a year to just kind of normal church uh context so this would be students who you see occasionally um, or maybe regularly, maybe a lot, you see them often, but they don't participate in anything that is related to your youth ministry. Um, so take a moment, and if you've got a student like that, just uh, give them a name. In fact, unmute yourself for just a moment, and we'll go around. I'll, I'll say your name, and you say the name of the student if you have one. If you don't have one, that's cool, but go ahead and unmute everybody, and uh, Who's, who is that student for you? I don't know, Hannah, do you, are you, would, would you have a category like that for you? Um, I'm not directly working with students, but I was thinking of some friend, doctor friends that we have that they're oddly fitting that. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Nick, how about you? Uh, yeah, I have a few years that I was at Blanchard. And again, it was 20, 20 years, so dealing with it a lot doesn't mean it was constantly like this. It just means that it happened several times over the years that I was there, the, the two decades that I was there. But it would be a family that's pretty pretty committed, at least attendance-wise. They might not be super involved, but they were pretty committed attendance-wise. But like uh, we had a Sunday morning class for high school kids that met during the 9 a.m. service at our church. And um, and then we would all, and then we would all go to the 11 a.m. service after that class ended. So the high school class was during the service. We go to the 11 a.m. service after that. But there were quite a few families that would just come to one or the other of those services, and their so their students wouldn't come to the class. They were they were only there, and they would just sit together as a family. And I kind of knew who they were because we had like you know a photo directory at our church, so we could look them up before Facebook. Um, we could look them up and see. Uh, the old school Facebook was church photo directories and it was very effective. Um, we could, I could look them up and know those students' names. So, but I didn't, but I didn't know them because they just never attended or participated. So that's the ones that I'm kind of thinking about. So um, it sounds like about half of you don't, don't even have anybody in that category. So we won't take a ton of time at this, but I just, 
you will have someone in that category at some point where you've got a family who comes to your church, they have teenagers, but the teenagers just don't show up. And my tendency was to take that very personally. And I want to say to you, do not take that personally. It, it may have absolutely nothing to do with you. It might have something to do with you, but it probably doesn't. It probably has something to do with their family and uh, the values that they have as a family. So some, I, here's some of the reasons that I've heard that students don't attend, and these are legitimate reasons. So there are families who don't believe youth ministry is, is good, or maybe, maybe not that it's not good, but maybe it's not necessary that if they're doing their job as parents, that they don't necessarily need their kids to go to a youth group. And in fact, maybe their you know, kids would encounter um, bad influences by going to a youth group. So they maybe have a, a sort of a mentality of let's, let's protect our family, let's put the fence up around our house and uh, keep all the bad things out and all the good things in. So that's sort of a mentality that parents can have. Um, there might not be a perceived, so there might not be a perceived need. And it, so it might be a parental value thing and it might be a sort of a perceived need. Like our kids don't need that. We read the Bible together, we're, we're engaged. And again, don't be offended by that. That isn't a bad thing. Um, if, if they're trying to set up their own little commune, that might be a bad thing, but that's not really your, that's not really your call. That's not your judgment to make <laughs> as to whether or not that's the right pathway for their family. But just, just realize that that doesn't, that, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you. It doesn't have, it doesn't say anything about the value of your ministry. So don't, please don't get beat up over non-attending students in your group. Um, I'll just leave it there for that one. Cause they, that one's, that one's sort of, um, that can be a frustrating one, but kids who are engaged in the church, but not engaged in the youth ministry, that's probably not our biggest fear. That's probably not our biggest um, uh, hill to, to climb kind of thing. So, all right. So that's the first category. Kids who attend don't, or who are part of the church, but don't attend youth ministry or participate in youth ministry. The second one is uh, students who are from the community. So uh, these would be students who you know, they're not a part of your church family, their families don't attend, but they're from your community. And you know them, you probably know them because they're friends of your students. So your students' friends that you've gotten to know, however you've gotten to know them. Maybe uh, you're at a student's house and you had some friends over, or you were out uh, at a restaurant and a student stops by with all her friends and, and they, and you get to meet them there. So these are, these are fringe kids because you know them. Maybe you've even learned their name. Uh, maybe you know a little bit about them. You've actually had a chance to talk to them, but they're fringe because they're connected to your youth ministry via a friend, but they're not attending your youth ministry. You're not having direct influence in their life. So, so, uh, Everybody got a name in mind? Just get, get, get a name in mind of a kid in your community. It could be, it, actually, it could be somebody who just happens to be your neighbor. Maybe you've got some teenagers who are your neighbors and you know them that way. So um, you don't have to say the names again because that, that'll take us forever if we do that every single time, I guess. <laughs> but have a name in mind. Be thinking about who that is as we talk through this one. Um, my Probably my number one uh, piece of advice, and this is from my own failures in this area, and I'm going to open it up to see what you guys do as well. But um, my number one piece of advice of advice here is that you stay connected to them, uh, whether you whether you feel like you have a, a deep relationship with them or or even a, a more than just a, a casual relationship with them. Stay connected to them as in as many ways as you possibly can, because every disconnected student or fringe student presents an opportunity. Every single one. It doesn't matter why they're on the fringe. Every single one of them has not. That is an opportunity. So um, here's a great example of that. There was a kid I knew in our in our community, and I knew him because he played soccer with one of my students and was a sort of a neighbor three or four do doors down. And I would see him pretty regularly. 
uh, with this kid who I knew really well. And so I got to know his name. I kind of knew who he was. And he was actually there the night that his brother committed suicide. It was partly his fault. He, he was so drunk, he couldn't help his brother who had overdosed on drugs and his brother died before they could get him help. And I didn't really, this was a fringe kid. This was a kid who I didn't, I didn't know that well. But when a crisis like that happens and they're just looking for anyone or anything to, to speak hope and life into them, um, I was the first call. I was the first call they made. I actually ended up doing his brother's funeral, which was one of the hardest things I've ever done. An 18 year old kid who uh, had, had so many great reasons to live, but, but died. And then to deal with the trauma of his brother who could have saved his life if he had not been as drunk as he was, he could have done something and wasn't able to, he actually passed out and couldn't help him. So not only were we dealing with the death of a, of a teenager, but we were also dealing with the life altering trauma of another teenager who, can, who lived on. That opportunity came because I knew him and I stayed in touch with him. One, one of the things that I wrote down here was um, keep track of them, say hi to them, and, and to be really specific, say hi to them by name. If you know someone's name, call them by their name when you see them. That, you know this, you know this from your own experience. When someone calls you by your name, you feel so much more connected to that person. When someone says, hey, bro, hey, dude, how's it going, man? You, you don't know for a fact, but you sort of suspect, I'm not sure they know my name. I'm not really sure. And if we don't know one another's names, uh, and, and by the way, that happens to me all the time that I have to call somebody bro because I can't remember his name or, or you know, whatever. Uh, it happens a lot and it happens to all of us. But, but do your best when it comes to, and this would be true with any fringe students, but do your best when you, when you see these kids, if you know their name, call them by their name. Even if it feels a little awkward to you to, to call them by their name, them knowing that you remember them is a huge... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That breaks down a huge barrier. Just that alone, knowing their name breaks down a huge barrier to a relationship. If you know their name, then they're like, I, I, I know that guy. You know, he, he, he's, he's a pastor, but he lets me call him James. I don't have to call him Pastor James. I just get to call him James. So, all right. So I want to stop for a second, um, and you guys can unmute if you have anything you want to add. But, but when it comes to these kids who are in your community, whose names you know, what are some things, is there, is there anything that you've been able to do with one in particular that just, it kind of broke the ice and gave you the opportunity to engage with them uh, on a more personal level? And maybe they even started attending, maybe they even gave their life to Christ and got baptized, whatever. But just have you, any of you had an experience that you want to share? Thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, that's really hard to hear. And um, uh, there's so there's so many opportunities. There's so many decisions that we make that we don't know what the results of those right. decisions are gonna be, are gonna be. Right? Like we make them every day. We make so many decisions every day. Some of them feel like very small decisions, but could have large implications. And sometimes the ones we think are huge end up not really being that important in the long run. So, um, so, yeah. so decisions we make, uh, we, do, we do look back with regret, but, but here's what I would say about regret or what, what I would say about your specific example, but examples like that in general that all of us have where we've made mistakes. I mean, oh man, I could, I'm not gonna do it right now. I could list a bunch of really bad mistakes I made with students who needed something other than what I gave them and the long-term results of that. Uh, I could spend a lot of time doing that, but I won't because what I wanna say is um, those experiences, not only do I regret them, but they also made me a better youth pastor. Those experiences meant that I, I dealt differently with the next person. And um, in, in that way, I believe every mistake we make is redeemable and is actually, is actually ripe ground for redemption. All of our mistakes, every, every stupid word we say, every 
thing, a phone call we left unmade, everything that every mistake we make is fertile ground for redemption because that's what God does. He redeems those moments that are brutal and broken. So you're right. We don't, I don't think we get out, I don't think you get out of an, um, a situation like the one you just described scar free. You get, you have scars from that and you have doubts about your decisions and all of that. That's for sure. But you also don't have to live in, in that, uh, in that space. There's redemption that God wants to do. And so we do it differently. I know I'm, I'm certain that you think differently now when you talk to students who have a similar scenario or whatever it is, you think differently about it because you're thinking about uh, Baker, right? Baker, doesn't it? Yeah. So um, anybody else on that one? Just the, the fringe kids from the community and ways that you've been able to in, engage them? Uh, one of the best ways that we've been able to engage with those kids is transportation. Um, a lot of them don't don't have reliable ways to get to and from youth group. So we arrange that and, uh, you know, obviously there's safety things involved and, you know, accountability and stuff, but some of the best relationships that I've developed have been with two girls that live about 30 minutes from the church and I offered to give them rides and you know during those car rides before and after youth group we have like incredible conversations and you know we can talk about life and you know things that don't have to do with youth group or things that do have to do with youth group and um it's just been a really really good way to get to know them better it's great anyone else on that one i was just gonna say um i think where people fall on the APES, like if you're pretty high in evangelism, um, reaching friends, students creatively is probably like one of your skill sets. <laughs> um, I just, I think, um, I feel like that's where I just like thrive is the, those students, the ones that are friends with those that are in the youth group or go to sporting events or neighbors like, um, yeah, I just, I love that when we can find creative ways to bring these students in to the fold or whatever we want to call it. But yeah. when you were talking, I specifically thought of a neighbor I had named Lauren and she just started hanging out and it was so fun. And it was just through, I think, inviting her to wrap Christmas presents, like, you know, those kind of silly things that aren't very threatening <laughs> or scary. Right. Pulls those in. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, there's a lot to be said about in this in this particular category about just missional living. What does it look like to live missionally um, in all of our relationships, whether it's at a coffee shop or the kids you know who who live next door or whatever it is, that we are never not on mission. Double negative intended. We are never not on mission. There's no that we're not. It's not possible for us to not be on mission. We can be really bad at being on mission. But uh, we are always on mission and we are always, um, opportunities are always abundant uh, around us. So how we respond to them is, is pretty huge, I think. Here's, here's one more thing I want to say in this category. And I may have said this to you guys before last time, maybe, or I know I've said it in some of the seminars that I've done at, um, at the district conference um, back when it was called Field Forum. Um, is it called district conference now? Okay. So, but that is this idea that I, I had this, um, I had a lot of pride around youth ministry. I, I, you know, people like when I would meet people on airplanes or something like that, and I, I would tell them what I do, they'd be like, oh, God bless you. You're amazing. Like I could never work with teenagers and blah, blah, blah. And my head would actually get really big about that. Like I would get really, I would feel really, really almost borderline arrogant about, yeah, I'm doing the real ministry in the church. I don't know what's going on with the rest of these departments, but I, but youth ministry, that's, that's the real deal. And, um, and one of the, one of the moments in youth ministry, uh, by the way, I never said any of that out loud. That's I'm confessing my heart at that moment, <laughs> the darkness of my own heart. Um, but one of the things that would, 
that would always sort of, I would always sort of feel that pride start to rise in me was whenever we reached a fringe kid from the community. Whenever we got a kid, especially the worse their story was at home, the more pride I took in the fact that we had somehow brought them into the fold and that we were now almost like their saviors. We were saving them from this horrible home life that they have or this horrible backstory that they have. And God convicted me um, ab about that. And this, is, and this was the conviction that he put in my heart. He, um, he told me, and I, I don't remember exactly how I would have worded it at the time, but he told me that pride, taking pride in those students and sort of feeling like their adoptive father was completely ignoring the fact that they had an actual biological family or, or whatever. They, have, they, they actually have a family. And he convinced me, God, God convinced me that when we have a student come into our ministry who, does, who comes from a non-Christian home, a non-church attending home, that is not an opportunity for us to become the surrogate parent to that child as much as it is a calling from God to reach that family. That's, a, that's an open door to that family. That child is an open door to that family. Even if they don't want that, that son or daughter going to your youth ministry, that's still an open door to that family. It's an opportunity to have impact there. Uh, so instead of having a savior complex, when, you, when a kid comes in off the street or into your ministry and you feel like you've rescued them from something, that should be another trigger. That should just be a trigger that, to remind you that you're on mission to that whole, you're on mission to this whole world. And that family, his family is, is, a, is a mission field for you. And I believe it's God's calling. I believe God calls you. God brings that student into your ministry and then calls you to reach that family. And they may be unreachable, but that's not your decision to make whether or not they're unreachable. That's, that's up to God. So uh, we are just called to, to love them and to care for them. And if we're loving and caring for their child, who knows what opportunity that might raise for them. That might, that might bring all kinds of opportunities to reach that family. So instead of feeling like a hero, it's not that you're doing, it's not that you aren't doing something great. You are when you bring a child, a child or a student like that into your ministry. But, um, but maybe the more important perspective is that there's a mission field opportunity right there with that family. So, all right, I'm going to go on to the next one. So we've uh, talked about fringe kids who attend your church, but are, are um, not a, uh, participating in youth ministry. Those who are from your community, not a part of your ministry at all, but you happen to know them, hopefully by name. And then the third one I have is, is the students who attend, <clears throat> um, but they're still on the fringe because of other circumstances. And so I put these into subcategories. So these are students who, are, who attend and participate in youth ministry, but something about their circumstances uh, moves them to the fringe of your ministry. They don't fit in the mainstream part of what you're doing. Um, so number one on this list for me is special needs. Students who are a part of your ministry, they're, they're there, maybe not all the time, um, but they're a part of it or they want to be a part of it, but they have some special needs. And I'll recognize, uh, first of all, that special needs is such a broad spectrum. Like it could be everything from a kid who's dealing with... Um, you know, attention deficit to a totally nonverbal quadriplegic uh, that could be potentially could be a part of your ministry. So there's there's a really broad spectrum here. So I want to be I want to be aware of that as I talk about this. But number one is if you have students in your ministry with special needs, um, I think your primary responsibility as a youth minister is to is to assess your environment, to look at the environment from their point of view. What does the environment, and that could mean the physical environment, like are there stairs and no way to get to certain things for someone who might be in a wheelchair? Um, do, do you have any way to minister to somebody that is hard of hearing or, or deaf? Is there, any, is there any technology you could use to, to respond to that? Um, is there uh, just so, so physical environment things, but also cultural environment? Like, what does the culture feel like in your room when they come in? Is the culture that everybody's playing dodgeball? 
and maybe they physically cannot participate in dodgeball, so they feel left out the moment they step in into the room. Or um, uh, just, I don't have to make up every scenario here. You can figure that out. You can just assess your environment from the perspective of a child with special needs. So that's the first thing I would say. And then the second thing when it comes to uh, special needs is you need parental guidance. You need to find out from the parents what that, if you can find out from them, what is that, what is that child capable of? Um, what are they not capable of? Uh, what are, how do they deal with them? How do they, what are the special environmental things that they have in their own home that you might need to consider making available um, at your, uh, where you are? Uh, what's going on medically with them? Like what medications might they need to have? Uh, is there an emergency plan if there's some kind of a medical emergency that is maybe a typical one? Like some, some people who um, have certain forms of paralysis commonly choke. They might choke. They might start choking. Are you prepared for them if they start choking? Well, you need to know from the parents, what do you do when they start choking? What do you do when uh, there's, uh, you know, some, some medical, what about an EpiPen? Like, is there something that I need to do? What are the things that you actually do to respond at home? Or what things are you prepared to do at home so that we could be prepared to do them in youth ministry as well? I'm going to tell you again, and this is from the perspective of my friends who have children with special needs. If you have that conversation with parents, you are going to blow them away. Because here's what most parents of special need kids are used to. They're used to people looking right past their kids because they don't know how to, they don't know how to interact with them. They don't, they don't want to interact with them. They're afraid of them. They're literally afraid of them. And, and if you've never felt that fear, um, you might be lying to yourself. I have felt that fear that here's a kid, especially I have, I have a friend who uh, some of you may even, even know him works for Envision Cleveland, but his daughter, precious girl, but just completely, she, she's a nonverbal uh, girl in a, in a wheelchair and she can't do much except kind of scream. And, uh, and it's, it's a little bit like, oh, how am I gonna interact with this girl every time that I see her? And um, I'm, I'm moving into a different category of response here, but when parents, know that you value their son or daughter enough to ask those questions. And again, huge spectrum here. It might be about medication. If you have a kid who comes in and cries for the first 15 minutes that they, when they arrive, that's probably a medication issue. Either they've just taken their meds and they're crashing or they haven't had their meds and they need somebody to, they need something to perk them up. So you have to watch for some of those things and, and then ask parents, just engage parents. This is, this is a um, theme with me, and it's because I failed so often in this area. Engage with parents about their children. Engage with parents about their children. You are not, you are not raising their children. Uh, we're doing that together. Um, I think I've talked about this maybe last time, but the idea that youth ministry exists to be a catalyst in the passing of faith from one generation to the next, that's what we're here for. We're the in-between. We're helping these parents pass faith on to their children. We're not abdicate, they're not abdicating and we're not taking on that responsibility. We're actually the catalyst, the thing that makes those two things work together. So engage parents all the time. And then there's the last thing I'll say, and then I'll open it up to see if any of you have any recommendations uh, from what you've learned working with students with special needs. And I recognize you might not have any with special needs right now, or maybe haven't. Um, uh, oh, yeah, so, so a big part when you're dealing with children with special needs is, and this is what I was sort of getting into, is uh, you should always come at it with an assumption that they are, uh, that they have value, that they are important, that they are individuals, that they have personalities, they have thoughts, they have opinions about things, they um, I think so often children with special needs and in particular, those that are nonverbal are treated as though they're stupid, that, that they're dumb, that they, that they can't, because they can't articulate words, 
that somehow they're not as it's that would be like saying if someone comes to our country like a, a doctor moves to the u.s from some remote tribal village in india and they're but they're a medical doctor but they don't speak english we would not automatically assume that they're dumb right like we would not we would not go well they don't even speak english i can't even communicate with them they're clearly stupid like we would never do that but i think that happens with children i know that happens with children who have special needs and are nonverbal that they get treated as though they don't have a thought or they don't have an opinion or that they don't um, feel sometimes because, because they aren't able to communicate the way that we want them to communicate or the way we feel comfortable with them communicating. So, um, so definitely respect their dignity and their value. And uh, I'm gonna say this in, an, in another one that I'm about to introduce or I'll introduce in a second here, but you need to have a ministry of proximity when it comes to children with special needs. So that means that you need to have people on your team who are ready to sit next to that student, no matter what. They're ready to, they don't necessarily, a, a non my daughters attend a youth ministry here um, in Vancouver, and there's a nonverbal young man in the group. He's probably 25 years old. I don't know how old he is, but he's, you know, he's more emotionally like a, like a middle school child but he's in a wheelchair and he's, and he's nonverbal. He can yell and laugh. Uh, I, he gets my jokes when I'm speaking and I make a joke. He's usually the first one to laugh. Like he's, he's clearly understanding the joke and he's maybe even a little quicker than some of the, some of the students around him who are verbal, but he's getting it and he understands it, but he, but he can't talk to me. He can't carry on a conversation with me. And um, just being next to him makes him so happy. When I just sit down next to him and talk, and just I, I talk to him, and and he flails his arms as as we talk, it makes him so happy. Just that someone would sit there. It's the ministry of proximity. I'm going to talk about that one again in a couple seconds. But all right, uh, special needs because I don't have a ton of experience with students in my own ministry with special needs. Just friends of mine who have children with special needs. But what are uh, some things if you've had an experience? Can you just share one real quick? That'd be great. Anybody who has. If you haven't, that's cool. We'll, we'll move on to the next one. A really great point, Bennett. And that is that um, this is my opinion I'm gonna share right now. So this might not be the way you all feel, but not every kid is built for small groups. Um, and in fact, some kids will never, will never be able to manage themselves well enough to be in a small group. And so, I wanna free you of the feeling that you're robbing this kid of, of a certain experience in your ministry because they don't get to be in a small group. They have to be one-on-one -on -one and off to the side. That, that, that's probably just the way it's gonna be. That's probably just, that's gonna be maybe their entire life. They're not gonna be able to manage themselves well enough to be in a small group where it isn't so disruptive. If it's minorly disruptive, that's one thing. But if it's so disruptive that they hijack the group and nobody else feels uh, free to do what you, you know, what you need to be able to do in a small group, which is share and have opinions and disagree and not beat each other up and all of those things that you, that you need to have. So, so I just want to give you a, a um, I guess I would say some grace there that it's, there are just some people who are not going to be able to be in small groups and you're not ripping them off it's um it's just going to be a fact of their life their circumstances dictate that or their or their needs dictate that so but thanks for sharing that i want to say something about um you said something at some point in there bennett i think it was you who said something about like you know i, I just wanted to maybe tell the parents you know it's not working out like we can't do this anymore that's often something that we have to say as youth, as youth leaders. There are, there are times where we have to say to someone, to some parents, you know what, for the sake of the safety of the kids in the group, for the sake of the ability to be able to lead a small group or be able to do this or that, um, we, can't, we can't continue to have your son or daughter in, at least during these parts or whatever it is. 
I would just say, if you ever have to make that decision, and that's the first time those parents are hearing about that, that you have not done your due diligence. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to tell somebody because you're so frustrated with them after so long, you're just like, finally, no, we can't have you here anymore. If that's the first time the parents hear that message, uh, you haven't done, you haven't done your job yet. You, and I've done that before. I kicked a kid out without telling the parents anything was going on. He was the worst student I ever had. He was also my senior pastor's son. He was the worst student I ever had. And I kicked him out without warning the parents that they, that it was coming because I was at the end of my rope. Um, and I, I, it was unfair to the parents. It was unfair to that, that student that this was such a sudden thing. In fact, they came back and the, his, the, his mom, uh, you know, our senior pastor's wife, she came back at me quite angry. Like how, like, well, who do you think you are that you can just like kick my son out for whatever you think is the problem or whatever. If I had set them up by saying, hey, we had some problems with your son tonight. And then a couple months later, or probably the next week, because it was every week, the next week saying, hey, same problems. It's really disruptive. I just need to let you know I've given him a warning. Uh, and then the next week, it's like, okay, I've given him his second warning. The next week is the third and that's the final warning. That's where he doesn't get to come back for a couple of weeks. If I had done it that way, I think parents would have been much more responsive. And that would be true with behavior disorder. That would be true with uh, autistic and disruptive. Anybody that's causing so much disruption that things cannot, that, that everyone is suffering. If everybody's suffering, leaders are suffering, all the other students are suffering, everybody's suffering, then something has to be done but you have to do the work to get to that point. So there's, there needs to be some, and here's what's really important for a kid with behavior disorder. I'm, I'm blending two, two subjects together here. So I'm, I'm putting this one now together with some of the, like you were describing the, the more autistic uh, end of things. That's not the same thing. BD and autism are not the same thing, but the way you deal with them in one way, at least can be the same, which is they need warnings. They need they need opportunities to change. They need opportunities to meet expectations before you take away privileges. So, so giving them incremental ways to figure out that, man, I'm not gonna be able to come again if I do this one more time, help them figure that out. It might take, you might end up doing that their entire career of youth ministry with you, but that's what they need. Um, a friend of mine once one time said to me, give students what they need, not what they deserve. And, and what she was implying, she was talking about her brother who I was kicking out of the youth group. What she was implying was, yeah, my brother deserves to get kicked out of youth group, but what he needs is to be in youth group. And I went back at her and said, I agree, but I think what he also needs is to know there's consequences to his actions. So we're laying out the consequences for his actions now, so. All right. Um, I don't, Hannah, are we normally just one hour? Is that what you guys normally do? Okay. Can I do one more? All right. I'll do one more. Go ahead. <laughs> Actually, oh man, the one that I want to do, the one that I really want to do is, is it's too long to get into. So I, I'll, I'll very quickly just say very, very shy students is the category I'm not going to talk about. Um, it's not that big of a deal, except that that's, a, that's another opportunity for the ministry of proximity. The student who comes and does not participate, the student who just sits there and doesn't answer questions. Uh, the rules I have for a student like that is never single them out, never force them to answer a question or do something that they don't want to do that they're, un, they're clearly uncomfortable doing. Uh, encourage them along, uh, encourage them give them an opportunity to answer if they want to, but never force them to do something like that. And then that's another one. Students who are shy and quiet are perfectly fine being shy and quiet usually. They're perfectly fine with it. They don't feel a need to speak up and be the center of attention. And they love to have somebody sit next to them and not ask them any questions. They love to have somebody just be next to them and and just sh and show that's again ministry of proximity just being next to them is ministry all right so the last one that we're not going to be able to spend nearly enough time on is the is the fringe students who are on the fringe because they have gender identity issues that they're dealing with or they have same-sex attraction that they're dealing with 
And um, I'm going to say for the sake of this conversation, because I'm going to cut it short after maybe, how long, how long can I go? Anna? Can I go like 10 more minutes? I mean, you can keep going and yeah, people can people bail on us to, if they yeah. want to. <laughs> yeah. If you need to go, you can go. But I, I'll go for just a little bit longer because I think this one is so important, especially right now. And uh, I'm not an expert on this one, I'll tell you that. And I've actually made some horrific uh, errors in judgment when it came to this. But students who are dealing with gender identity issues or same-sex attraction, I'm going to just talk about the ones that you already know are dealing with those. Um, I'll guarantee you there are students in your group who are dealing with that who you don't know about. You have no idea. And if you've been around long enough, you'll know that someday uh, someone will come out of the closet and make an announcement to their family. And you might go, hmm, yeah, no, that makes sense. I suspected something like that. Or you might go, oh, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea. And both of those things tell me that you have to be careful. <laughs> you have to be careful about the way you uh, determine how much you know about a person's orientation or their identity uh, or, or what they, how they self-identify or, or what their uh, sexual attraction orientation is. So, um, so here's, my, here's my top three rules when it comes to students who have, have come out of the closet or have said or have I or have said I'm I'm struggling with identity my my orientation I'm struggling with my uh, orientation of my identity if they've come out and said it out loud and you know it here's the first three rules you need to listen then you need to listen and then you need to listen what they don't need is a sermon what they don't need is to be reminded that these are sinful thoughts and sinful behaviors. What they don't need is to be told, um, uh, is to be shown Bible verses that, that make them feel shame, shameful. And because here's what will happen. They will go, oh, well, clearly this is not a safe place for me. The church is not a safe place for me. And if you were to ask anybody struggling with anybody who's who's openly talking about their sexual orientation or their sexual um, or their uh, gender identity if you were to ask any of them if they're openly talking about it what does the church think of you and they would say i am not welcome there i am not a safe person there and i actually heard a, just the other day on the on the radio i heard this irish pastor um, who deals a lot with with people in these categories and he said that they often call him and they're like, um, they're like, what do I need to do to be able to change so that I can fit in in my church? Like, how do, how do I continue to stay in my church? And what do I have to do? How do I fix all these problems I have? And his answer to them was really, I thought was kind of counterintuitive and yet really good. His answer to them was, you need to be safe. The first thing you need is to be safe. And if you're not safe there, if you're being judged, if you're being put down, if you're being persecuted for what you're saying out loud, you're not safe there and you need to find a place where you're safe. Well, what a heartbreaking reality if people who are broken and asking for help and seeking help and trying to understand something that is not easy to understand if no one will listen to them. And in fact, it's the opposite. People judge them, call them names, uh, show them all the reasons that they're sinful and broken and all. My, my rule there is, um, I, I think of the woman caught in adultery and Jesus' response to the woman caught in adultery. What was his response? His response was, hey, I'm going to look around the room here and any of you, any of you who don't have sin, you can keep judging this guy who just told us that he has um, same-sex attraction feelings, right? If you don't have sin, then feel free, throw it, throw the first stone. And um, if we can't create a safe place for people like that in the church, they will never believe, they will never believe the message of the gospel that we try and share with them. If you're not safe, you can't, if you feel attacked, why would you want to believe that, <laughs> that this God, that these people supposedly represent who are attacking you, that this God actually loves you? So um, I wish I could say so much more. There is a book that my friend wrote. He's actually an Alliance pastor out in Ohio. It's called uh, Ministering to Gay Teenagers. 
Um, his name is Sean Harrison. You can find it on uh, Amazon, probably just about anywhere they sell books. Ministering to Gay Teenagers by Sean Harrison. And Sean uh, shares his testimony in there of being a, a, a guy who grew up with same-sex attraction. And until he understood his identity in Christ, he didn't understand that he wasn't defined by his sexual orientation. He thought he was defined by his orientation. And in reality, he's defined, he, his definition uh, comes from Christ. And so that's, that's a good book. It's not, it's not a perfect book. Um, but Sean would probably say that too. He's not a perfect guy, <laughs> but he's a, it's a story of grace and redemption. And it's just a, a story of, in my opinion, it's a story of listening. Who's going to listen? Who's going to value people who, um, who honestly tell the truth about where they are and what's going on? If you think you don't have any gay students in your group, you're probably wrong. If you think you don't have any who are questioning their gender identity, you're probably wrong. Um, I believed for a long time we didn't have any gay students in my ministry because I because I couldn't see them, you know, whatever that means. And now I know that several were. And and um, I, I, in hindsight, I know that, but I didn't know it at the time. So, all right, that's uh, we're we're over time. But is there anything you guys wanted to say or any questions you have or whatever it is? Yeah, I just looked down at my notes and there was this one thing that I that I wanted to say, which is true in all of these cases. Um, all of these students, those who are disruptive, those who are shy, those who are transgender, whatever it is, their story is not done. Their story has not been written. Right. That's why we do what we do is because if we didn't if we wanted to work with people who are not um, malleable, then we'd go work with the adults. <laughs> we'd all be in adult ministry we we work with teenagers because because the, their story is not done being written that's true for adults as well they just don't realize it none of our stories are done being written there's always hope there's always um uh possibilities for grace to infect their hearts and uh and that's what we wait for so I did not uh, deal with one really important one just because we just don't, don't have time, which is students who are of a, of a minority ethnic race in your ministry. But uh, a lot of the things I've already said here would apply to them. Um, and from my own experience with an, an African-American daughter uh, who, who I adopted when she was just um, a few weeks old, uh, she's, she had some rough experiences at church with racism that people thought wasn't racism. And so being, being aware of that and even helping your other students, you know, your majority race students um, be sensitive and be aware is really important, I think. So that's a big one. So you didn't get to deal with that one, but. Cool, all good? Yeah, awesome. Thank you for that. Thanks for leading that conversation. I took a lot of notes myself, <laughs> so it's really good. Yeah, good, good stuff. Thank you. It's great. You guys are doing great work. I want to tell you that I, you know, um, sometimes youth pastors get praised because you're doing such amazing work, and sometimes you just get beat up, uh, or, or worse, ignored. Um, but I just want to encourage you: stay in there. Love, love those teenagers um, with your whole heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say love them because you won't always like them. So, so we must love them. So exactly. Yeah. Good. Thanks guys for having me again. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. I put in the chat um, that Ashley Dalen is, she's going to talk to us. Um, April, yeah. I put the date, April 8th at two o'clock. Um, I think that's the right date. We're, we're moving it to the second Thursday because of the training being so close to Easter. Um, and she's gonna talk about her experience with working with students in her ministry who, who I think she's had some transgender students. She shared a little bit at the youth pass retreat if you were there. Um, so she's just gonna talk about her journey and learning and all of that. So um, James, maybe that can be a relief a little bit that like, okay, I started the conversation and we'll continue. <laughs> Yeah, and you, I mean, yeah, so uh, Ash is doing something, and then you said there is also this Christian 
um, sexuality video with Jackie Jackie Hill Perry. That's great, by mm -hmm. the way. It's really good. So there's some you've got some good resources in there. Um, yeah, and we'll be we'll be mailing out a few other webinar opportunities um, around that topic. So I've found three so far, which is way more than we may be able to handle <laughs> with all yeah. of the online stuff we're doing. But, you know, even if you could jump on one of those, I think it'd be good. So look for those emails. They'll be coming. So, cool. yeah. Thank right. you, James. Thanks so much, everyone that was able to hold on. Um, I appreciate you. And um, I look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> Thanks guys right. so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.